Week three. Week three. I literally never know how to open up podcast episodes. Well, it's our third week, and as you may be able to tell if you watched week one and two, we're trying a whole new setup, trying new intros, trying new topics, so it's a lot of trying. Yeah, we can't hit this, because I noticed myself I was hitting that, too. Did I just do it? Yeah. Uh (laughs) (laughs) We're learning, we're learning. But the sad part is, I've been doing podcasts for, like, two years, and throughout those two years, every single time, I was like, what do I say when I first open it up? I'm pretty sure every single one, I say, welcome back. Welcome back. (laughs) Welcome back. Okay. Today, what are we talking about? We are going to talk about course our fertility but what a diagnosis meant and what it was like from each other's perspectives um to maybe think that you are part of the problem or a problem or or just like what it means when like you have to you're internalizing these things and i think we're just going to talk through what you experienced what i experienced the differences and how we support each other yeah because i think it's uh, so i'm the one with the issues here. It's my body. It's not Stevens. I have endometriosis. I have adenomyosis. They found two infections in my uterus. Um, I don't ovulate every single cycle. I have something called loose luteinizing on ruptured follicle syndrome. Um, what else? I had low progesterone. I had high estrogen. But yes, but, but that's not how it all, it's not like we got there day, oh, yeah. day one, yeah, yeah, right? Yeah. So, I mean, and I'm sure we'll talk through it, but those things came over time as we discovered one thing after the other. The, the most frustrating part for me of the whole fertility um, medical practice is the lack of a definitive test. Like you just have to do all these things and you slowly uncover more and more. So um, that didn't all happen overnight. No. And in fact, it took us two years to even get any type of diagnosis. Two years. Two years of seeing many doctors. So when... We were starting and we, we tried to conceive basically right after we got married around like April of 2020. When was the first time you got checked and started to wonder, oh shoot, is it my body? Well, it was a little bit different than I feel like the average person would because I had a miscarriage. Right. So I never really thought that I would have any issues. I mean, none of us do, right? We was none of us think... Second or third time Third trying? month trying, third, third month, but like right. second actual month trying. Okay. And had a miscarriage, and then that's when my cousin was like, you should go get these like simple blood work done to mm-hmm. make sure you just don't miscarry again. Because mm-hmm. the assumption was we're going to get pregnant pretty quickly again. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. We didn't. <laughs> surprise, surprise. Right. Um, but that's when I went and found a, a normal OBGYN, and he told me I had to have two more miscarriages or try for a full 12 months right. to get blood work done. Right. And that's when I said, absolutely not. Like, that's insanity to me. Now you want me to go through two more losses. Or Mm -hmm. we have to go through this for, like, 12 months. Mm -hmm. So I sought out a NAPRO doctor, N-A-P-R-O. It's an OBGYN that specializes in NAPRO technology. And they don't make you do any timelines. They don't make you have a certain amount of losses. I mean, it's like, let's just get to it and let's figure out. And Mm -hmm. their their whole thing is they figure out the root of what's going on. Right. So that's kind of where we were. And that was – so the miscarriage happened in July of 2020. And that was October of 2020. We first started running tests. Okay, so you started running tests in October 2020. Mm -hmm. Got results of some sort? No, everything was normal. We went through two years of me and him, everything coming back normal. But these were basic tests. Like it was like blood work. It was making sure I was ovulating, which... That's a whole issue in itself. Like it was just like simple tests I was getting run. That's like the... I don't know what you would, what you hear. Like, okay, these are the tests to get run if you're struggling to get pregnant. But the reality is, is there's a lot more tests that you can get done. And then there's a big difference between um, what is a normal range and what is an optimal range while trying to conceive. But for this purpose of this episode, that's helpful because so October 2020, after we get married in April 2020, we have the miscarriage in July, and then you finally get to the point of testing. I think for me throughout that whole period, I'm curious what you you were like, I didn't see it as a case of infertility yet. I saw, okay, well, a lot of things came back normal. We can keep trying. Like at that stage, it was just things haven't gone our way, but like this is, I guess, crazy yeah. looking back now, but like no red flags, obviously, in this carriage, but no major ones. I was still was like, hey, you know, 
because you were on birth control at some point in your life, right? Yeah, 10 years. 10 years. So it's like, you know, you told me that and I was like, okay, maybe that's running its course. You've been off it for a while, but I'm sure your body's adjusting. So the point is, I was still very much so hopeful. No one's body's at fault. We're just six months in or whatever. It's, that's where I was. I mean, I was hopeful too, but I was also scared I was going to miscarry again. So you, so as early was, as October, were already yeah. on the path of like, oh no, it could be my body or something. I like very vividly remember my parents came out and visited us when we were in Virginia. Mm-hmm. And it was like right after the miscarriage. Mm-hmm. I can't remember why they were there, but it was right after the miscarriage they came and visited us. And my mom was like, oh, it's going to happen. It's going to happen. Mm-hmm. Don't worry. It'll happen again. Like, you know, women are so fertile after miscarriages, which is, you hear that all the time. It's not true. It's not true. But you hear that all the time. But my, so my biggest fear was we're going to get pregnant again and I'm going to miscarry again. Mm -hmm. It was never, oh, I'm not going to be able to get pregnant again. Okay. So So I didn't think that I like wasn't going to be able to get pregnant anymore. So your first stage of this for you was, okay, I miscarried. Now I'm worried that I'm going to keep getting pregnant and miscarrying, but everything else I think I'm going to keep going as of 2020. Yeah. Well, yeah, I feel not like looking back. This is so weird to say because sometimes I'm like, do I think this now because we've been through this for so mm-hmm. long or like did I have this feeling? But I remember being younger and two two thoughts came to mind when it came to babies. One was I want twins really mm-hmm. bad. I've always wanted twins mm-hmm. my whole life. The second sick. one was, yeah, it would be sick. <laughs> the second one was it's going to be hard for me to get pregnant. Y- and y- Sorry, when did you think that? that I, was... Ever since I was a kid. Ever since you were a kid you yeah. thought that? Okay. And I don't know why... But, like, I just remember, like, growing up having these thoughts of mm-hmm. it may be harder for me to have kids. Mm-hmm. But I never had the thought of I wouldn't be able to get pregnant. What was leading to those, like? I have no idea. I couldn't pinpoint it. Okay. No clue. So not someone in, like, your personal life that you knew that did and some... some... No, because I didn't really know of anyone that had miscarried or struggled to have babies. I mean, our next door neighbors who we grew up with, they had seven kids. Right. I mean... Your mom came from a huge family. Yeah, my mom came... My mom's one of eight. Yeah. Like, it... I never thought issues would happen. Like, I mean, we grew up in these Catholic communities where everyone's having a ton of children, you know? I would say from the start of ours, I truthfully always thought, because there was no history there, there wasn't really history with me, um, I really do think our problem was going to (laughs) be how many do we want. I I truthfully did. I was like, we're starting right away. I was like, man, we're probably going to have four pretty quick, and then do we keep... Those were all my concerns <laughs> going on. Yeah. That's so crazy yeah. that that was a, oh my gosh. Yeah. Oh, because I mean, th- looking back, I remember you and I talking about this and I was like, I want three to four and you were like, I want an army. A basketball team at minimum <laughs> yeah. with, some, with some subs in there maybe. <laughs> yeah. So I was just like, three to four is my limit. Yeah. And I remember telling Steven, this is so crazy. I'm about to be 30 in September. And I remember telling you. That I want to be done having kids by the time I'm 30. <laughs> uh, well. <laughs> I was like, I want to have my body in my 30s. And, you know, I want to be done out of that stage. Because mm-hmm. I thought we'd be able to boop, 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 boop. You know, not really the topic of today. But I do think in the blessing in disguise in some areas is like you kind of have to give up control a lot. Oh, exactly yeah. Exactly that. You know, people do that with career with stuff. But, like, you just think... Okay, I'm gonna plan it, then I'm gonna execute, then it'll be done. And it's like when it doesn't happen, whoa, what happened? Yeah, you have no control. So you're in October, you're thinking, I've got blood work, inconclusive, and then. And at this point, it was just me getting blood work done because I was more so trying to figure out like why I miscarried. And then yeah. we were like running other tests too, just to see. And then fast forward to March. Had ran a bunch of blood work. We did some monitoring cycles. March of 2021. So almost a full year in. Almost, yeah, almost yeah. a full year in. Uh, I had a HSG done in a sauna histogram. And then you had your sperm sample done. Right. So leading up for me up to 2021, um, I really didn't think anything was going on. I probably wasn't the most supportive, truthfully, because I was behind in terms of, eh, it's just you know, uh, there hasn't been enough time. And I, I just thought you were like over analyzing things. And mm-hmm. so that's where I was. The first test, she's so much better at timelines. I, I couldn't tell you this. So you're saying I first got tested in 
March. March of 2020? Yeah, because I remember it was right around when I had my sauna histogram done. Yeah. And my HSG, and that was so painful. Because that was kind of like next steps. I can't really remember why it took so long from like October to March, but... Mm -hmm. For whatever reason, it did, and I had my HSG done and my sauna histogram done, and those were the two most painful tests I've um, the uterine biopsy, and you were there for that one. Yeah, you're screaming. Up about. until then, those were the most painful tests I've had done. I mean, yeah. and they say that it's more painful if something's wrong, mm -hmm. and so I was like, oh, maybe I have blockage. And people also say you're more fertile after it because if there is any blockage in your tubes, because what it is, it's just like saline getting shot through your tubes to make sure everything's open. So they said that if there is something wrong with your tubes, the saline can kind of like push out the blockage. Mm -hmm. It was so painful that I thought like, oh, there had to have been something there. And then I get told, everything's fine. Everything looks great. Mm -hmm. And part of me is like, was it though? Because a year later, mm -hmm. they found endometriosis in both of my tubes. And so, okay. So I wonder like if that's why it was painful. I mean, I don't know. But they don't recognize that then. You come back no. home and you... What's... Everything's normal again. We get in, told in everything's normal yet again. Right. You get your sperm sample done. And I feel like I at that time, I was almost like... Not that you ever want anything wrong, but you want yeah. to know an answer. You yeah. want to be able to be proactive. And that's kind of where I was. I was like... Can, can we figure out something here? And yeah. I remember, like, before you had it done, I was like, oh, it would be nice to know if there was something going on and we could fix it, and then mm -hmm. boom. But then I do remember, like, those two or three days we were waiting to get your results. Like, they had received it, everything we were waiting. That was, like, high anxiety. And I was kind of yeah. freaking out. Like, what if he, there's something going on? I had to put it out of mind. Um, anytime I did deep thought on it or it crept in I certainly was just oh man like I really to your point I, I didn't want it to be me but at least I want it to be a solvable problem mm -hmm. however at the bottom end of the day it was oh, please like I really just can't handle that and that, that was the first glimpse I probably had into your world of uh oh what if it is a process in my body. Gone Meanwhile, on. I'd been going through it since October, you know, or right. before that I'd been going through it since the miscarriage. And I can't, July. but I can't emphasize enough. I don't know if it was just a natural progression. Like, I mean, this has developed over time and even how we view it. Cause I mean, back then, if you were talking to Steven, then one-on-one -on -one with me, I'd probably be like, yeah, Addie's probably like overthinking. Like I just was not on the same chapter book. <laughs> like I was nowhere near. Yeah, and I think maybe that also, too, is, like, my gut feeling, women's intuition, mm -hmm. whatever you want to call it. Like, mm -hmm. I just, I, I didn't know what was wrong, but I knew something was wrong. But mm -hmm. never, ever, ever once did I think I had endometriosis. Not well, once. I, I didn't know what that was at the time, so there's no way I could think that. I mean, that I knew because my mind was being opened, because I was sharing on social media then, mm -hmm. so I was obviously seeing other women share, too, and, like, my mind was being open to this. And I'd get DMs from people all the time being like, maybe you have endometriosis. Mm -hmm. And right. it would almost make me mad because I'd be like, no, I don't. Like, right. I do not have endometriosis. No doctor has told me. Like, ever since I was younger, I've always been told I do not have endometriosis. There's no way I have it. And so basically after March of 2021, we kind of went on a year long of like, let's try and heal things naturally. So that's where I was. I was doing acupuncture. Uh, I was focusing on diet. I was focusing on exercise. We were still trying we tried some medications then all during that time. Like, again, we, I was told that I had unexplained infertility. Which is tough. And from my perspective, for her, she's willing to try anything. But anything. I mean, like, you could give me... Yeah, you would try. I mean, it could be whatever. And, and this is where I probably started to have... What's the right word? Not really resentment. Pushback. Where it was like you were so... Which makes sense when you think it's your body or something wrong with you you're just willing to try whatever um i had gotten all clear on my end and so you know you, you wanted to change for good reasons diet supplements things we use all across the spectrum and that's i think where we first begin to rub a little bit because i was just like okay it's unexplained fertility are we just going to try because there's so much to try out there i mean if you really wanted to you, oh, could, yeah. you could flip up your entire grocery list what you do every single part of your life you could try and gear and I think it. you need to do it in stages too I mean that's what I did it was like slowly changing out products slowly doing this and that like 
it was stages of all of that to get to the point where, you know, it was still not happening. We were still not getting pregnant. But, and from the male side, though, and I'm curious to hear your take, it's like, I think as the man, you should want to try and be supportive. And it took me a while to get there, right? It took me a while of, like, digging my heels. No, she doesn't, to, like, be willing to try some things. And then I started to do a few, and, like, I just, anything that you would implement that was low cost to me in terms of giving up or whatever, I was fine. But what was your, like, what what did that look like for you? Because I know for me it was, like, Digging my heels or changing everything, pushing back for a yeah, while. Yeah, it makes me think of when you were doing that freaking zen. Oh my gosh, that tobacco. Yeah. That is tobacco, right? It's just nicotine. Nicotine. Yeah. Ugh. Well, that was like, I think that was like our biggest fight. And it wasn't necessarily because you were like, you know, like, I don't want to give up nicotine. It was more so like it was another thing I was making you stop doing. If you go down this, this rabbit hole of like chasing things to help with fertility or potential things, for me and my analytical brain, it goes into like correlation causation where it's like, gosh, it seems like everything was correlated with a potential increase of fertility. A lot of things are. Right. So it's like giving up alcohol, you know, nicotine, give up like certain foods, process, all that stuff. So we had to find a balance though between, you know, your asks and where I was willing to. And it is a balance because there, I think the man, if, if he's not going through it, really does have to. It's hard to do all those things alone to be supportive, but then mm-hmm. on your side, and you can speak to this, you can disagree, honestly. But like, you kind of have to be like, okay, I can't make him do everything. Yeah, and that's. I mean, I had to do a lot of it alone because mm-hmm. there was so much pushback, and also like, you know, everything was clear on your end. Mm-hmm. But I mean, there was still things though, like if you are overweight, if mm-hmm. you are not active, if you are not eating your fruits and vegetables, if you are not getting clean protein, like you're going to feel better. Like you can't mm-hmm. argue with me that changing these things aren't going to make you healthier. Mm-hmm. Like they are going to make you healthier. They are going to make you feel better. Mm-hmm. They do affect your sperm, your egg health, all these things. Mm-hmm. Maybe not drastically, mm-hmm. but they do help. Mm-hmm. So that was my thing. I was like, we are told nothing's wrong right now. Mm-hmm. I'm going to do everything I can. And like the little things do add up. Mm-hmm. Like, I'm going to argue with you on this one because you said the rabbit hole of things. And, like, Mm -hmm. I don't like that view because Mm -hmm. it can feel like a rabbit hole. And Mm -hmm. it can feel like, you know, like, oh, I need to figure out what actually works, what actually doesn't. We don't know. Mm -hmm. We don't know. But I'm going to do every damn thing I possibly can until, like, I am pregnant. Yeah. I think we still have some disagreements in this area for sure where, like, yeah. I think there are a lot of good things to try. However, I think as humans, um, we're going to fail if we put the pressure to to 180 every single aspect. You can't be perfect. You can't be perfect. So if you are someone that's like, I mean, if you follow me on social media, I talk a lot about clean products. I talk a lot about clean eating. I talk Mm -hmm. a lot about gut health. These things, and I, it can be very overwhelming, but you have to realize I've been doing this for three plus years. And it's come in steps. Like, I've figured it out. I've done small change-outs as I've gone. Um, there are still things that I do and I eat and I use that are not perfect because you can't be perfect. Mm-hmm. And sometimes it's just too much. Sometimes it's just like, yeah, I, I'm going to freaking eat this or I'm going to freaking do this and just enjoy myself. Right. And so there's going to be a difference in relationship on a ton of topics, not just yeah. fertility. So, you know, I think as good husband and wife, we both have to... One, talk to each other, which shout out to the podcast for letting us do that live on air. But we do have to say, okay, what's one thing you can do? That's how it was helpful for me throughout this whole thing was like, okay, I can get behind at least one thing and make that change and build up and that, But that's the frustrating thing when you don't have a diagnosis. You can't figure out what that one thing is. Right. So fast forward mm-hmm. and – sorry, I cut you off. Were you going to say something? Just that you, you can't figure it out so – try one thing but don't yeah. feel like you have to do it all at once especially in as a spouse i want to be there for you but it does take time for me to be like because we don't have a if you told me today xyz which i know we can't okay of course i do it so like it's a lot of life changes but that's what we all wish we could have like don't mm-hmm. you wish someone could just tell you hey take this for this amount of time mm-hmm. you're gonna get pregnant Right. This is not the reality. Right, but it's also not the reality. If you go out there, you could you could literally find 300 things yeah. to change, so there's some balance there. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And you got to figure out that balance for you. Mm-hmm. Like you got to figure out what's best for you. Like some people I'm I'm 
told that I'm an extremist. Mm-hmm. I'm also told I'm not doing enough. Like mm-hmm. you can't win. You got to just figure out what's best for you and stick to that. And that's why I'm trying to say on a spouse level, there is also that balance because you're going to choose that. But I do think that it's unrealistic to expect whether whichever side it is, the other person to immediately flip onto everything. And that caused friction in a relationship when we tried to that or that was happening a lot and it scaled back. I think we got to a much better place. When you're also so desperate for this one thing you've wanted your Mm -hmm. whole entire life and you Mm -hmm. have zero control over getting it, Mm -hmm. I mean, you will, you, I mean, there have been some crazy freaking things I've done. Like you will, like you kind of go crazy. So then fast forward a year, um, it was, we don't need to go into our story because we have a whole episode on that, Mm -hmm. but April or March, April of 2022, sit down with this new doctor after we moved. And she's like, I think you have endometriosis. Mm -hmm. I think you have adenomyosis. Wow. Look, you have loofs. Mm -hmm. Oh my gosh. Your estrogen is high. Your progesterone is Mm -hmm. low. Like literally going through all these things, like one of your tubes is blocked and you have endometritis. Mm -hmm. It was like, whoa, 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 whoa. And so that was very overwhelming as well. I mean, I wanted a diagnosis so badly, so badly because I wanted to know what I needed to do. I wanted to know how to help my body. Like I find diagnoses to be empowering Mm -hmm. because it's like, okay, now I know X, Y, and Z. I can help my body in these areas, Mm -hmm. right? When before it was like, sure, I'm switching out my products. Is it helping? Well, and now it's like, yes, it's proven that switching to a cleaner lifestyle, low toxic lifestyle does help endometriosis, does help adenomyosis. Mm -hmm. So anyways, I get the diagnosis and we can talk about both of our point of views on this, but I went through two weeks in last July after my lap surgery of the most wild emotional roller coaster Mm -hmm. because I got out of surgery and I was in such a fog and being told that I have endometriosis, I have adenomyosis, both of my tubes were partially blocked. One of them was fully blocked. They were able to fix it. You know, I had endometritis again during mm-hmm. that time. Um, it, it was like this whole slew of things. And it was like the first initial reaction I had, because I remember coming out of surgery and you and my mom telling me this, and I started crying because I felt like, oh my gosh, it's my fault. Mm-hmm. This yeah. is my fault. Yeah. I'm the reason we're not able to have a baby. I'm the reason you're not able to be, it's going to make me emotional. Yeah, like, I know. I'm the reason you're not going to be able, you haven't been able to be a dad. Oh, yeah. And I put a lot of blame and pressure Mm -hmm. on myself. Mm -hmm. And I just, I felt horrible. Yeah. Because I really did feel like, I'll get myself together. (laughs) I really did feel like it was, it was my fault. Yeah. Like, I, and of course the thoughts go through my head of like, if he married someone else, he could have been a dad by now. Mm -hmm. Like, if he could have you know, fallen in love with someone else before me or whatever, like his life would have looked differently. He wouldn't have had this trial. And, you know, me, I'm stuck with it because this is my body, you know, Mm -hmm. but I really did feel like it was all my fault. And I went through these emotions in a two week span after my surgery of like, okay, I have this diagnosis. Mm -hmm. Oh my gosh. These are the changes I need to make. There's no guarantee we can get pregnant. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, and I felt I had a lot of blame. And you didn't share this with me immediately, right? I mean, that two-week period, it's not like you expressed that. I could probably, you know, because yeah. you can pick up on sadness and stuff, and I'm not blaming you, but I don't know if it was two weeks exactly, or, but at some point you did express it to me. I believe it was just like at night in bed, and you kind of just cried, and like you told me that. And I'm not an expert in these things, but there was only one thing in my mind. It's like, it's not your fault. I mean, if it had been me, like if I put yourself in shoes, I would feel horrible and hope there would be the support. So and all I could think of to do in the moment as now is like, I love you. Like we're doing this together. It's, it's us. And then if we can't like, so be it. Um, I don't get to define a lot of things in my life. Um, I certainly don't blame you for it. Yeah. But, and that's the point though. I think for like a spouse to be able to just, take that blame off, take, take it away. And if you are feeling like I never really felt that way, but I could see why maybe other people could come to that conclusion after time. But I think just 
supporting the other person and saying you love like no one's and in control I think of like this. the reassurance from you really helps because right. uh, I'll like never forget you being like you know Addy even if we got married and I knew all of this was going mm-hmm. to happen I would still marry you again right like I would do it yeah. all over again I would choose you again and like that's something that I've like really clung on to because it's easy to get down that pathway of like it's all my fault you know mm-hmm. he could be happier with someone else mm-hmm. you know he could have kids with someone else all this and that mm-hmm. but knowing like okay you know you love me for me we'll figure it out and you've always said like we're gonna have kids one way or another like right. you know whether it's adoption or it's our own or whatever that looks like like we're going to have a family mm-hmm. it's just hard to figure out how we're gonna get there. Um, but I mean, I've definitely gone through spouts. I mean, in this past year of ups and downs of being like, again, like, even though you've told me it's not my fault, I just feel a lot of blame. I feel there's a lot of pressure. I feel there's a lot of anxiety and stress that comes along with it. Mm -hmm. And then when we did the DNA fragmentation for your sperm, Mm -hmm. so it's like a much deeper test into your sperm and DNA fragmentation can be a cause for miscarriages and all this and that. So we did that test through the company Fertilisys, and I remember that time just being like, God, please no. Please (laughs) do not let, like, another stack on thing. Like, please do not let anything else be wrong here. Mm -hmm. And not, and again, like, it kind of made me think about it through your view that you've looked at me. It's like, I wasn't going to blame you. You know, it wasn't right. your fault. Right. And my therapist has told me something that's really stuck with me as I've talked about this topic with him. He said, it's not your fault because you are not in control. Mm-hmm. If you were controlling your body not getting pregnant, then it would be your fault. Mm-hmm. But you are not controlling that, so therefore it is not your fault. Yeah. And that's something that's really stuck with me. And I thought about with the sperm DNA fragmentation, it's like, you know, he's not controlling this. It's not his fault. We are literally doing everything we possibly can yeah. to freaking get pregnant. And one piece of advice I have for this and for others that you actually just brought up is it's interesting. You immediately were able to be almost kinder to the hypothetical version of me not being fertile or being infertile than you are to yourself. And I find like oh, that's yeah. so true with so many things in life. Like sometimes it's just like project your situation or your issues as a third party and talk to yourself as you would talk to someone else. And I find like that's just super powerful just to, you're just, I don't know, sometimes you can, well, it depends on the person. Some people are too easy on themselves, but I'm hypercritical. I think you're pretty hypercritical. So like oh, yeah. it can be nice to... everyone, you're more critical to on yourself. Most, yeah. Exactly. So it's like, you know, just how would you treat another person going through this scenario? Like what type of forgiveness or mercy or love would you show them? And you know, that's a good way to probably... And also, like, think it. about other people you may know going through it where it's, you know, it's her body or it's his body that's causing the issues here, right? Like, how do you think of them? You don't think of them like, mm-hmm. you know, it's their fault. You know, she's right. the one, right? No, but of course with ourselves we do. So, you know, my best piece of advice is give yourself grace. Mm-hmm. Figure out how you need, you need that reassurance from your spouse if you're mm-hmm. feeling that way. And, like... Please, please, please open up and talk to them. Mm -hmm. I know I have a really hard time with that. Like when I'm going through it, a lot of times like I'll feel all the emotions and I can't quite process everything and I don't open up until I've processed it and almost have a solution rather than just opening up in the moment. And, you know, therapy has helped massively, both couples therapy and solo therapy Mm -hmm. with that. But Mm -hmm. I think overall for this particular situation of feeling like it's my body, it's my fault, or it is my body, but, you know, the feeling of my fault, the best thing you've done is just the reassurance over and over and over again. Like, every cycle where I find out I'm not pregnant, it's the, we're going to get there. We're going to get there. We're going to figure this out. Yeah, and you'd be surprised the reassurances, especially someone that loves you, will give you. There's a lot of fear until, like, you do it, and then it's like, all that fear goes away. Usually. I don't know if there's people out there that wouldn't be reassuring, but I wouldn't let that fear get in the way. Like, the only chance you give yourself to have the opportunity for the other person to like express that reassurance is by sharing with them ultimately oh yeah absolutely don't be afraid to share right don't be afraid to share don't be afraid to open up Mm -hmm. if it does seem scary to open up i highly suggest couples therapy because that's always a great gateway date nights are good date nights yeah getting out of the house out of your environment gosh that's really helped us have a drink go enjoy yourself like get out that's always helped Mm -hmm. if you don't drink don't drink (laughs) 
know? <laughs> yeah. Enjoy yourself. Just getting out of the house, getting out of the environment that you're in. Yeah. I think the yeah. environment is key. Just, I mean, it could be a coffee shop or whatever, just a, a dedicated space or like a new space where you're not in your routines and you can kind of just renew like a dating aspect and yeah. maybe that's a different topic for later, but yeah, absolutely. So just know if your body is the one that has the issues, it's not your fault. It is not your fault. Mm-hmm. Speak kindly to yourself. Another trick my therapist told me to do is to get sticky notes and write on them. Um, one of them is like, my body is my biggest ally or my oldest ally. Um, you know, my body's capable, just different phrases that you can reassure yourself. Um, you know, speak to yourself kindly. You are kind. You yeah. are smart. It you is important. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and then obviously ask for that reassurance from yourself. Like have the conversation. Have Bring up the topic. You know, I know it's scary. It was so scary for me to do because in my head I was like, what if he does agree? What if he does <laughs> think? Like what if he does say something like, yeah, I probably could have kids with someone else or, you know, whatever. <laughs> like, what if? And, and of course, that, like, that was actually... But your mind's a tricky thing because it can give you what you think are, like, good arguments and they're so bad or, like, so, like, absurd. Like, stuff like that. I mean, it just would never cross, you know, my mind. Um, yeah. But I know, but of course, there. in my head. Yeah. Exactly. So. so get it out of your head. Talk to your spouse. Let them be supportive. And, yeah, go from there. And just know that you are doing everything you can. Control what you can control. Let go of what you can't. Easier said than done. Mm -hmm. But we love you. (laughs) We will be back next week. Uh, I've got a topic for next week. Write it down.